So before we get started, osteoporosis, did you know that one in two women in the United States and one in four men will have a fracture due to osteoporosis in their lifetime? That's the bad news. And who doesn't want to be one of those statistics? Raise your hand if you don't want to be one of those statistics. <laughs> well, the good news is you don't have to be. And there's so much that we can do to really have optimal bone health and keep our bones healthy throughout life. And that's what we're gonna be here to share with you today. And I'm just so excited to be working with Marta on this and be presenting this today. So welcome everybody. And Marta, did you wanna say anything before we get started? Hi everyone, I'm so happy that all of you can join us today. I've been working with Suppers and it is such a great organization. I've just made so many friends, so many memories and I've learned so much. So I'm excited to share everything with you today and hopefully um, we better your health today. Okay, so we'll get started. We have lots of information. And so here we, and we'll have time at the end for questions. So I'm just gonna share our slides. Okay, so let's, so the bone zone. And just a disclaimer that the information presented in this program should not be construed as medical advice. It's not intended to replace consultation with your physician or healthcare provider. So the objectives for today, is that by the end of the talk, you'll have a good understanding of what bone is, and you'll understand some of the key bone building nutrients and how you can get them from your food, which is such a part of suppers. That's why I'm so excited to be doing this talk for suppers. You'll understand the very basics of exercise, what we're trying to achieve in terms of why we exercise for our bone health, as well as the role of stress and happiness. Most people don't think that has anything to do with our bones. But by the end, you'll understand why, as well as having a few things that you can put into your life to not only improve your bones, but also increase your happiness. So who doesn't wanna wake up a little happier tomorrow than you are today? So to start, it's gonna be important to understand that our bones are living and growing. Bones are mineralized connective tissue and they're mainly composed of a 35% base of collagen. And then they contain calcium and other vital minerals layered on top. And you can see that on the image on your left. Bones are so important. They're important for our movement, support, they protect our vital organs. And they also house the bone marrow, which is essential for developing the white and red blood cells. And in healthy bones, we see three types of bone cells. We see the osteocytes. We also have the osteoblasts, which build more osteocytes and help build more fresh bone. And then we also have the osteoclasts, which break down bone. So to understand healthy bones, it's crucial to understand bone regeneration and the bone remodeling process. And we're gonna go into more detail in the next slide. So the bone remodeling process, this is when the osteoclasts, the bone breaking cells, they're gonna come in and get rid of old del bone forming small pits. That collagen from the bone is then released into the body fluids. And then in step three, the osteoblasts, the bone building cells are gonna come in and lay out a new collagen foundation. So ultimately in healthy bones, there is no net change in bone mass, but a balance between bone breaking and bone building. And actually believe it or not, but we replace our skeleton every 10 years. So that really helps put this process in perspective. So when we think about a definition, osteoporosis, what that means is porous bones. So there's a few things that make it up. One is just lower bone mass. Number two, there's a deterioration of bone tissue and a disruption in the bone architecture. So instead of being nicely woven together, there's a disruption. And we can see that if we look at the normal bone here and look at the difference in the osteoporosis. I think everybody would agree they'd rather have this normal bone holding us up. Also, it compromises our bone strength and increases our risk of fractures. 
But here, so osteopenia, like what do those things mean? And the way it's diagnosed is from a bone density test called a DEXA. And all they do, they look at your bone and they compare it to that, to the bone of a 30 year old, of a healthy bone. And they look at standard deviations away from that. So if it's anywhere from zero to minus 2.5, it's labeled osteopenia. And if it's from anything lower than minus 2.5, it's considered osteoporosis. And the interesting thing about the DEXA, you know, everybody's so worried about their number on the DEXA test, but it only is showing bone strength. It doesn't show the quality of the bone. So there can be two people with the same bone density and one is eating well and doing all the things we're gonna talk about today. And the quality of their bone is gonna be very different than a person who isn't doing these things and has the same bone density. So it's not the only determinant by any means. It just shows you how much bone is there, it does not show you the quality. But we can see here, this shows normal bone and to the right is osteoporosis. So who's at risk? I mean, right now, 54 million Americans, half of adults age 50, as we said, older will have a fracture, you know, one in four in this country. In this country, it's worse than in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, it's one in three men, three women and one in five men. But here it's one in two women and one in four men. But for women, the incidence greater than that of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer combined. And the interesting thing is, we're not, we don't really talk about that. You know, as children are growing up, we don't even mention bone health. It's something that people think is an older person's disease, but that's so far from the truth. So everything you're learning today, teach your children, your grandchildren, because when we're younger is when we're building bone and it's sort of like a bank account. You know, what you build when you're younger, you can draw upon as you get older. So it's so important, our habits when we're younger. But this slide is critical because what is the root cause of osteoporosis? And a lot of times this is ignored, but yet it's extremely important because we want to make sure we're covering all our bases. It could be inflammation. A lot of people don't realize that inflammation can be affecting our bone health. And so they don't even evaluate really environmental toxins. What medication are you taking? Hormones stress, which we're going to talk about later, but so often people will come to see me and they're so worried. Are they eating the right foods? Are they doing the right exercise? And they don't realize that the stress itself is actually affecting the osteoblast, the bone building cells. And then excessive use of alcohol, hormones, and diet. And that's what we're going to really spend most of our time on today. And that's so if you've been, if you're a member, if you come to suppers and you're listening to this lecture, you are probably already in great shape with your diet. But today we'll just learn a few more things. But it's just so important because it's the combination of all these things. And I just believe it's important not to just say, oh, okay, I've lost bone, but to figure out why and to get the proper evaluation. So starting off our funny bone fact, so we actually take one to three million steps per year. So our femur bones, the ones that are highlighted in red, are actually stronger than concrete. And what I found, I've been working with people with osteoporosis for over 25 years. And that's why the good news is there's so much that can be done. And I often think that it's sort of, you know, you feel fine. And then you find out you have osteoporosis and all of a sudden you have these images conjured up in your head of an older person, not, not able to enjoy life or take trips or be with grandchildren. But on the other hand, I believe there's always a silver lining. So when you find out, then all of a sudden you start doing these great things and guess what? Your health improves in so many areas. So I find it's a combination of nutrition, of exercise, stress reduction, and happiness. And that's what's worked for me as well as so many people that I've worked with. And we're gonna talk about that today. That can not only help your bones, but your overall health as well. So we're gonna jump right in and talk about bone health and nutrition. And just to clarify, all this information is based on solid scientific evidence. So before we start talking about nutrition, it's important to discuss digestion. And the way we digest is going to help optimize and improve our overall nutrient absorption from food. And that's gonna give us those vital minerals and vitamins needed for bone health. So some tips, slowing down when you're eating your meals, 
deep breathing before eating, chewing your food and drinking water. So these are the bone healthy nutrients and there are a lot on this list, but we're going to look closely at a couple of these. And so we're gonna analyze calcium, magnesium, protein, vitamin D, vitamin C and vitamin K. So let's start with protein because this is really misunderstood. And there's been, there are a lot of people think, oh, too much protein is gonna cause too much calcium released in my urine. This is like a lot of people were thinking that you know, excess protein is not good. The research has shown that not to be the case. The research has shown, sure, we don't want massive amounts, but that most people as they get older are not getting enough protein. And this protein is absolutely essential for your bones, as well as your muscles. As a lot of people get older, you see what something's called sarcopenia, where they're just losing muscle mass. Muscle mass, muscle mass. And one of the big reasons for that is they're not getting enough protein. So collagen, which is part of the bone matrix is protein. And as well as protein stimulates insulin growth factor one, which increases calcium absorption into our cells. So it's just crucial to really see, you know, a lot of people know that they have to have a diet that's with a lot of vegetables and that's, but very, very important that we get enough protein. So you're probably wondering how much protein do I need a day? So we have a great resource for you, the calculator.net slash protein. And on this website, you can input your age, your gender, your height, your weight, your level of activity. And it's going to give you um, the level of protein in grams that you should be taking in or eating every day. So this information is coming from the ADA, the CDC, and the WHO. So let's look at an example. So around three ounces or 70, 76 grams of protein a day. So how can you accomplish this? So looking at 3.5 ounces of chicken or one cup of tempeh, this is gonna be equal to around 30 grams of protein. And then adding in a couple of lentils, some raw pumpkin seeds, broccoli, even some chia seeds, we're at around 70 grams of protein already. And then our power punch for this section, for the protein section, is gonna be tempeh. Just one cup of it is 31 grams of protein. So here are some top vegetarian protein sources. And just to look at some of these, we have almonds, we have organic edamame, beans, quinoa, chia seeds, just some great sources. And now to compare steak and broccoli. So if we're getting 100 calories of steak, that's going to be around 1.3 ounces. And then 100 calories of broccoli, that's going to be equivalent to three cups of broccoli. And even though that's a lot of broccoli to eat, you're getting less fat, but you're also getting phytochemicals, vitamins, and essential nutrients. And what phytochemicals are, these are chemical compounds that are going to be produced by plants that are essential for um, resisting bacterial infection. So ultimately, you're preventing disease and promoting health. And one thing to note about protein is when we're eating, when we're introducing protein into our diets, we want to make sure that we're buying organic, grass-fed, and wild-caught produce. Okay, calcium, and this is what everybody knows. Everybody goes to the doctor and they may, are you getting enough calcium? And most people are you getting enough vitamin D and exercise? Those are the three things. Typically what I've been seeing is what most people are told. Here is the problem. What I see all the time is that people are taking actually too much calcium. And the reason is that they're getting calcium in their diet and oftentimes their doctor will tell them, oh, make sure you get 1200 milligrams. So they're now taking 1200 milligrams of supplement and getting it in their diet. And this is a situation where more is absolutely not better because too much calcium, there's been some studies, nothing 100% conclusive, but that's showing that this extra calcium can go places we don't want, such as the kidneys and the heart and the arteries. So we definitely do not want more. And the best way to get calcium, I mean, even the, even the National Osteoporosis Foundation says food first. And that's what's so amazing about suppers because you have so many good recipes as we'll be showing you. But calcium is really important for your muscles, your nerves, so many functions in the body. And the problem is no matter what your body is, it can't allow your calcium blood level to, to go down. So if you're, if you're not getting enough, 
from your food or supplements, your body's gonna take it from your bones. So it's really important we get enough, but we don't want too much. And in terms of how much calcium, it's actually different in different countries. But in the United States, the suggestion is for anybody under 50, around 1,000 milligrams. And this is food. This is from food and supplements combined. So we don't, you know, this is just total calcium. And anyone over 51, anyone over 50, around 1,200. Again, this is the most. So let's look at some great calcium sources. So we do see a lot of dark leafy greens in here, but we also see chickpeas and, and black beans and white, and white beans. So to look more closely, collard greens, just one cup cook has 266 milligrams of calcium. And then bok choy, two cups, 150 milligrams of calcium. Actually, that's one cup. We must have written that wrong. One cup has 150. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then kale is one cup, 94 milligrams of calcium. So like Margie was sh showing you, so we do need around 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium. So how can we get this calcium into our systems? So looking at one cup of collard greens, 266 milligrams, sardines, oatmeal, yogurt, we're at around 1,041 milligrams of calcium already. So our power punch here is collard greens, just because it's, it has so much calcium in already, just one cup, but then it's also so great to incorporate in many recipes. So reading food labels is crucial. So when you're looking at the back of a food product, you might see something like calcium 30% or calcium 15%. So how do you understand how much calcium is actually in this product? So a quick trick, just add an extra zero. So you see 30% calcium, that actually means 300 milligrams of calcium. Then if you see something like 15% calcium, 150 milligrams of calcium. So here are some great calcium rich recipes from the supper's website, collard green wraps, salmon cakes, and a power punch kale chips. Now this is a picture of one of my patient's sons and you can pass it forward. So if you, so if you are, you're eating healthy and what's so funny is when she would, she would tell me she'd come home from the supermarket and he would say, kale, kale, mom, did you get the kale? because kale chips became his favorite snack. So how great is that? He here he's asking for kale chips versus Doritos or some processed food. So what you learn, pass it on because it can really make a difference. We, we have one question. Um, Jackie's asking, can you get too much calcium from food as a source or is it mainly if you're adding the supplements? No, that's a good. Every day. Um, they so haven't really found too much calcium from food, but they haven't, you know, it's sort of hard to get too much from food unless you're drinking, you know, fortified. I would certainly wouldn't have fortified foods that are fortified with calcium. Um, when they did the studies that showed that there could possibly be problems, it was mostly from the supplements. So, it, and I said, it's very hard to really get too much unless you're having food that's fortified with calcium, which is similar to taking a supplement. Thank you. Okay, vitamin D, and we've heard so much about vitamin D in this, in, in what's going on with COVID recently. But I'm for sorry. I was meeting her here. I didn't know you were closing. It's her first time here. I was trying to explain that I was coming here with my advice. Okay, vitamin D. So vitamin D is absolutely essential for calcium absorption. We must have vitamin D. Now we can get it from sunlight. We can get it from some fatty fish, you know, salmon or mackerel. When you're getting vitamin D, or even if you're taking a supplement, it's best to take it with a meal containing fat for absorption. But here is something critical, is that we want, it, it's that important that we want to test it and not guess. And the thing is, we should all make sure we can ask our doctors for to find out what our vitamin D level is. So basically it's called vitamin D 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That's the name of the test. And most people are getting it today. Most doctors order it. And you don't need it every, every time you get your blood work done, but just to see what your base level is. So to see, are you getting enough? 
And just one thing I want to say about vitamin D is that with COVID, what they found, it's so important for your immune system. People who were dying in the hospital or more people who are hospitalized had lower levels of vitamin D. So there's a lot of vitamin D deficiency and it's something very important. But again, just get the test so then you can figure out the optimal amount that you need. Are you getting enough or are you not getting enough? And your healthcare provider will help you with that. Because this, the values are very low. It says 600 IUs, international units. And for most people, that is not going to be enough. That's not going to be enough to have the values that they want on the test. So for most people, it's at least 2,000. Most people need around 2,000 to even 5,000. So again, talk to your doctor and get this checked so that you're getting enough vitamin D. And unfortunately, because we're not living near the equator and we can't get that much from our food, most people do need a supplement in addition to it. It's something very important. So how can we get vitamin D through food? So um, mushrooms, especially white mushrooms, um, sardines, salmon, mackerel, actually even sunlight can get us our vitamin D. So how are we gonna accomplish our vitamin D levels? So we can look at examples. 3.5 ounces of wild caught salmon, 988 IUs. One half cup of white mushrooms and two large eggs, and we're already at 1,442 IUs. So our power punch for this is gonna be adding white mushrooms to our meals. And then here are some great recipes from the Slippers website, the salmon avocado egg salad, and my favorite, the grilled portobello mushrooms. I, these recipes are not to be believed from suppers, I have to say. <laughs> it's making me hungry, actually. <laughs> I love these, and they're such good pictures, too. Thank you. Um, we have one other question about calcium. Do you want to wait till the end, Margie, or do you want to? Yeah, well, I mean, if it's quick, we can answer it. Okay, um, Jennifer, I don't. What's okay, wrong? great. Hi. Um, there was one from Jill Stone before me. Um, should, should she go first, or? Well, why don't we do the calcium one, and then? Okay, well, she, it was a bone question that Jill had. Um, so I thought it was calcium related, but I'll go, I'll go. So um, Margie, great presentation. The best way to measure the values of calcium in your blood, is it just a, a regular blood test? Oh, that's such a very good question because you can't, it's not accurate because your body will do whatever it needs to see if you're getting calcium from, you know, it'll, it'll take it from your bones. So you're not gonna know because your blood level would be normal. Uh, if, if your blood level of calcium is low, then there's some, or too high, then there's something actually wrong that you need, you know, it's not, it, so it's not as though other blood tests that they're going to show. Um, there is a way to find out your micronutrient level. There's, there's a couple tests called like SpectraCell or Vibrant Health, but in general, it's not going to be a valid test because. Okay. It, you know, Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. And then uh, Jill had asked if bones regenerate every 10 years, how does building bones when you're young impact that? Oh, because 90% it stays there. So we're just, it's just keeping the bones new and fresh. You know, a lot of people think you get the bone and that's it, but that's not the case at all. And that's why, you know, that's why it keeps us, keeps it healthy. So, but good question. Thank you. Uh, okay, so magnesium, this is essential. The body does, has over 600 chemical reactions using magnesium. It's crucial for calcium absorption because it helps the calcium get where it's needed. So it's not as though calcium just works alone. Calcium needs these other nutrients. The good thing about magnesium, it helps with relaxation and who doesn't want to be more relaxed? It also helps with constipation and most people are deficient. That's the problem because it's not, it used to be in our soil. It used to be, it used to be a one-to-one -one ratio. Our ancestors were getting calcium to magnesium, which is not the case. But some symptoms you may have to know you're deficient are anxiety, irritability, leg cramps, restless leg. You know, a lot of people will say at night they get those cramps and then magnesium, they're so, you know, it can make a huge, huge difference. So how much magnesium do we need? And this is just the RDA's recommendation. So the RDA for people, for women is 320, you know, this is from 30 to 50 and men 420. But the truth is they've done more research and 
in speaking with so many physicians and healthcare providers, again, the one-to-one -one ratio is what our ancestors had. So most people feel you need at least half the amount of magnesium that you get calcium. So if you're getting a thousand, at least you know, 500 minimum. And, and you can't, you know, too much magnesium well, is, is really not a problem unless you're, you know, from a laxative perspective, if you're taking <laughs> like calcium citrate, you could have two loose stools. But again, most people don't get enough and it's something really important to help us absorb the calcium and get it in the right places. And so where can we get this magnesium through our foods? So to look at some examples, sesame seeds, almonds, pumpkin seeds, cacao, dill, basil, broccoli, spinach. And just one thing that I wanna add is sesame, sunflower and hemp seeds um, are higher in omega-6 levels. And that's just something to keep in mind if you have an elevated lipid, pa lipid panel. So then how can we get the 320 to 420 milligrams of calcium into our diet? How can we accomplish this? So one fourth cup of roasted pumpkin seed, adding in spinach, quinoa, even sprinkling some chia seeds into a salad or an oatmeal, this is around 404 milligrams of magnesium. So our power punch for this is gonna be pumpkin seeds and chia seeds. They're so easy to add to any dish, they're full of nutrients. And so here's some recipes, again, all from the Supper's website. And just to highlight one of my favorites, the raw almond mock tuna salad. Yum. <laughs> As I said, I'm getting hungry with these recipes. I'm just looking at them. They're so impressive. <laughs> okay, here comes some really important information. So everybody listen in, because this is what's missing. This is what I see is missing, vitamin K. Most of the people I see, depending, um, you know, or it's just not something all the doctors are saying, you know, make sure you're getting your vitamin K and we're going to go over this because this is essential. So there's two different types of vitamin K. So there's vitamin K1, also known as philo I never pronounced right, philoquinin, not known, but vitamin K1 is what's involved with blood clotting. And they've been studies that shows it can reduce bone loss, but really important, it can prevent fractures. It helps the flexibility of your bones. So if you fall, you're, you, can, you can absorb the forces and you will not fracture. So this is really essential. And the great news about vitamin K1 is that it's easy to get in your food. If you're eating leafy greens, collards, kale, spinach, you're gonna get your vitamin K1. It's so easy to get from food. So let's look at more detail. So how can you get 120 micrograms of vitamin K and even more, like Margie said, we probably do need. So one fourth cup of fresh basil and one fourth cup of fresh parsley, just these herbs alone, 29.4 micrograms in the basil and 246 micrograms in the parsley, adding some sweet part. We're already at 570.4 micrograms of vitamin K. So adding parsley, adding basil to our dishes gives us an extra boost of vitamin K that we all need. Okay, vitamin K2. Now this is the one that most people are not getting enough of and absolutely essential because it does two things. What vitamin K2 does is it activates a protein called osteocalcin and osteocalcin takes the calcium. So because you get, you know, now we're getting these high levels of vitamin D. So we're getting all sorts of calcium now in our systems, but now we have to get it into the right places. And so I think it's dangerous actually to be doing high dose D without this K2, because it's taking the calcium, getting it into our bones and our teeth by activating the protein osteocalcin. So it takes it where it needs to be, part A. Part B, it also activates a second protein called the matrix GLA protein. And what that does, that takes it out of, it sweeps it out of our soft tissue. So out of our arteries, out of places it's not supposed to be. And that's what's so critical. And they've done studies on K2 showing how fantastic it is for heart health as well, because it's taking sometimes, you know, calcium where it shouldn't be, you know, it should not be in our arteries. So I think this is critical. And I think as time goes on, it's getting 
functional medicine doctors all talk about this, and I think it's getting more and more into mainstream, but there's no downside of K2. They haven't found anything about overdosing at all. And it's just so important if we want to get the calcium where it's supposed to be. So there's different types. There's type MK4 and MK7. MK4 is from animals. It's you can get it from, from animals and M, you know from and, and MK7 is from fermented food. So there's one, and, and animals are really good at converting. You can convert the M, you know, you can convert like in your bodies from from one to the other, but the humans are not so great at that. But here's the key. There's something called natto in Japan and you can see it on the right. And that's this slimy type of food. The places that they had natto or eat it have significantly reduced fractures, significantly reduced osteoporosis. And there've been studies on how natto can completely reduce, I think it's around 50% your risk of fractures and osteoporosis, it's huge. Unfortunately, it doesn't taste good. So you know what? Mary, there's, there's supper's goal. That, find a good recipe for natto because it's, it's, I know I had one patient who was eating it on a regular basis. I mean, this can make such a difference in our bone health. But unfortunately, it just, you know, I have to be honest, I haven't tried it because it just looks so awful. But I, I think it's a goal of mine to try to see if we can come up, maybe we can work together with suppers to come up with something. But anyway, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do an auto cook off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do a prize. Right? And make it into a chili. It's got to be good. Because <laughs> it's so powerful. I think this K2 is something we absolutely, absolutely need. And I just wanted to say one more thing about K1 that I forgot to mention. If you're on blood thinners, absolutely check with your doctor because, you know, we don't want to, you know, and you're on Coumadin or anything, we don't want this interfering with your medication because it does, if K1 affects, you know, blood clotting. So it's a, you can find natto at, at Whole Earth. Um, I think in, I've seen it at Whole Earth, the Whole Earth Center, and in Whole Foods. But I was I was afraid, so I haven't bought it yet. Yeah, we have to. Yeah. <laughs> it's with the sour. It's with the sauerkraut. It's like with the the live sauerkraut is where you'll find it. <laughs> Thanks. So speaking of sauerkraut, actually, it's very high in vitamin K two, four point eight micrograms, which is a hundred um in a hundred milligrams. So, but then also the natto that we were just talking about, 1,103.4 micrograms in 100 grams. There's also other sources in chicken breast and in egg yolk. And then here are the vitamin K recipes that you can actually find on the Supper's website. So the butterless chicken, that's gonna be the one that's gonna be high in vitamin K too. And then the rutabaga and green stew and the carrot salad, those are gonna be high in, in, the, in the K1. Okay, vitamin C. So vitamin C, as we know also in these COVID days, everyone's taking it because it helps our immunity and there's so many benefits to vitamin C. However, it actually helps the bones because we talked about, Marta showed that great picture of the matrix of the bones and, what, and that's gonna determine if you fracture as well, how healthy are your bones? So the vitamin C is important for that good collagen matrix. You know, it's the protein and the vitamin C that together help with the collagen. So it helps the blood vessels, the cartilage, the muscles, again, the collagen for bone mineralization. And there's other things with vitamin C. If you do more research, it can protect tumor cells. But again, those are higher doses and that you would need to speak to your doctor about. But it's really phenomenal vitamin C. And it also acts as an antioxidant. So what is an antioxidant? So the best way to explain it is through this picture. So we see a vitamin C antioxidant, um, Muhammad Ali, and he's knocking out an oxygen radical. And then, so what are oxygen radicals? These are gonna be oxygen species that are produced as byproducts through our body's metabolizing processes, also maybe from UV damage and sunlight. So they're always running around throughout our system and they're causing that much damage. So having a vitamin C antioxidant that could come in and knock out these bad radicals is so helpful. And then, so here's a great table of just great vitamin C sources. And just to highlight a couple of them, one guava, 126 milligrams, one large pepper, 340 milligrams, and one cup of broccoli has 80 milligrams. And also at the bottom here, one cup of parsley, 79 milligrams. 
And we talked about parsley in the vitamin K1 section. So all these foods are kind of overlapping with each other. And then, so on average, adults need around 75 to 90 milligrams of vitamin C, but these, but these are the minimum levels. Actually, research shows that we need more vitamin C just because it helps with our immune system, especially now with the COVID pandemic, we all need extra vitamin C. So one cup of broccoli, 80 milligrams, one grapefruit, 77 milligrams, and papaya, 88 milligrams of vitamin C. So already we're getting 245 milligrams of vitamin C. So our power punch for this section is adding broccoli where you can into your meals. And then here's some great recipes from the Supper's website, kale and cauliflower vegan stew and roasted Brussels sprouts. Mm, so delicious. <laughs> Now it keeps getting me hungry. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about something some people know and some people don't, or people know about this, and it's now it's becoming so incredibly popular, but it also helps our bones, and that's what's really interesting. So let's talk first about prebiotics. A lot of people know about probiotics, which is the good bacteria, and we all know that the gut, you know, Hipp Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. And they're really seeing that that's the case, that the gut is so very important. And when it comes to bone health, a healthy gut is essential so that we get our nutrients as well as we absorb our food, but even more than that. So when they, what they're finding now is the diversity of the bacteria, the different bacteria actually improve our immune system, reduce inflammation, and all of that affects our bones. But so besides just the probiotics, the probiotic, the, you know, the good bacteria needs food. So we need the prebiotics. This is the food for the probiotics. And the good news is we can get it from our food. So here's just some Jerusalem artichoke, raw dandelion greens, raw garlic, leeks, raw cooked onions, asparagus, banana, but even like the underripe are actually better. Apples, chicory, chia flax, wild blueberries. And there's even more. You can you know, look up different prebiotics, but we can get this easily from our food. So that's great. And then probiotics are living organisms. You know, they're bacteria or yeast. And it just fills us up with the good bacteria because oftentimes we, you know, whether we've been on antibiotics, a lot of people who are on the, the ANSAIDs, you know, the Advil and different things like that are actually reducing, you know, there's so many things that can happen that we reduce our bacteria. So we need to repopulate. And so the prebiotics and the probiotics, and just this is so healthy for our bones just to create a healthy and diverse. So it's not just taking one thing, it's diversity that's gonna make the big difference here. And I just wanted to say one thing though, Everybody's individual, and there are some people that have a problem, what's called SIBO or, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So if this causes you a problem, you know, just because we're saying take probiotics, make sure it doesn't upset your symptoms. So it's just something to be aware of, you know, when, when you're adding these things. Because sometimes people with SIBO I've seen, this can make them worse. So you need to, you know, work, each person has to figure out what's best for them. Okay, so in terms of our bones though, there have been studies that show it can prevent bone loss, boost the immune system, reduce inflammation, which affects our bones, promotes healthy digestion, and also synthesizes some of the vitamins, the vitamin K, B9, and B12. So it's very important. I mean, and this is, I think, coming, it, it's just becoming more and more important. So some of the research on probiotics, they've done a lot of animal studies, but they've actually done two studies on humans that have shown this one lactobacillus ruteri, it reduced bone loss and inflammation. And then a few of the other lactobacillus, three different strains put together, protected the lumbar spine bone loss in postmenopausal women. So these are just some of the studies. I know there's gonna be more coming out. So, but anytime you can get these probiotics, it's just a win-win situation. Plus, these are your warriors. This is your first line of defense against sickness and illness, this good bacteria. So who doesn't want more of it? We can actually get probiotics from our food So some examples, kefir, sauerkraut, um, kimchi, miso, kombucha, natto that we talked about previously. And most of these foods are high in lactobacillus, that lactic acid producing bacteria. 
So you can actually make your own kefir. You can buy the grains and you can infuse it through water, um, even through milk, your choice of milk. So here are the recipes for, for you if you're interested. And it's also so important to be making this at home because it's, it's easy to store and it's also, you're truly getting the best probiotics and the best nutrients while you're making it at home. And here's making your own kimchi. Here's a recipe for you if you're interested, but also kimchi is so great because it's easy to make, it's delicious, it serves as a great side dish, and it's great to store. So here are some probiotic rich recipes, um, barley miso soup and a beet carrot pickle kidney bean sauerkraut salad, which has a great color, and it's also so fresh and delicious for the summertime. So our funny bone fact, um, according to Mary Ellen Sanders, a pro, uh, microbiologist, if we actually took the bacteria in our body and we laid it end to end, it would encircle the globe 2.5 times. So you can imagine we're actually filled with these little bacteria. So besides getting the good food, it's also important to limit the worst bone culprits. And we're looking at something like refined sugar, which actually reduces your absorption of magnesium, calcium, and protein. We also wanna avoid anything with high fructose corn syrup, processed foods, white flour, and white rice. Okay, so we, we, we provided the key things with, with our diet. And I'm just gonna hit on this because this could be a whole hour talk, but exercise is absolutely essential. It can increase our muscle strength, prevent bone loss, increase bone density. Studies have shown this, improve balance, reduce our fracture risk, increase flexibility, improve our posture, which is so important, and increase our happiness and overall health. So exercise is essential. But what exercises do we want to do that actually have been shown to increase bone density? So it falls into two categories, resistance, and that's strength training and weight bearing, where you're putting weight through the bones against gravity. So what that is, so let's talk about resistance. The bones respond to the forces placed upon it. So if I'm contracting my arm against a resistance, that's resistance is saying, hey, we need more bone here. So that's, so it could be free weights, it could be resistance bands, or it could be the exercise equipment at the health club. It could even be if you're using your body as resistance and your weight. And the other thing though is walking, dancing, anything going up and down the stairs, hiking, where we're going, we're, you know, we're working weight bearing against gravity. But I just wanted to quickly tell you what's unsafe because a lot of people don't know. They did a study at the Mayo Clinic years ago. They'll never repeat it, but they showed a significant increase in fractures for people who were doing rounding exercises, bending forward, because it puts too much force on the vertebrae and it increases the fracture. So anyone with osteoporosis should not do any rounding forward bending. I even say with osteopenia, because you can do it bending from your hips instead of the waist. So you can do neutral postures and you can do, you know, keeping your spine straight. And that's what you tell any of the yoga instructors that neutral spine or extension is really very good. Also, you don't want end range. You don't want the extremes of rotation or side bending because especially if you're in a yoga class, don't have any overpressure, too much torque on the spine. And just quickly, because I said I was going to mention stress and happiness. So stress, unfortunately, the uh, cortisol is the stress hormone. And cortisol reduces the osteoblast, the bone, the activity of the osteoblast, the bone building cells. So one of the things Marta had mentioned before eating to take a few deep breaths that will increase your absorption of your nutrients, well, it will also reduce your stress. So any deep breathing is wonderful. And the last thing, you know, that's, that's my one tip, you know, deep breathing, but a couple things for happiness, since I love happiness, and I found that happiness reduces stress as well as just improves all health, every possible, every, you know, everything improves when people are happier in their life. But they actually did a study on life satisfaction and bone mineral density, how dense our bones are. And they found that life satisfaction predicted bone density. So there was a nice correlation. 
So have fun. You can increase your happiness and improve your bones. So here's my tips for both reducing stress and increasing happiness. Just get outside. You know, the rhythms we operate at a fast, medium to fast pace. Nature's rhythms are slow to medium. So just getting outside grounds us, relaxes us, and makes us happier. Exercise. Exercise is great if it's not in your life. Find something you love, though. Don't just say, oh, I have to do this for my bones. No, you're sending bad chemicals. You want to find there's a million different exercises you can do. And then I'm going to give you three things because a lot of us are swarming with negativity because, and what happens, because 80% of our thoughts are negative. So how sad is that? And that can, you know, that can affect you when you focus on grows. So here's the tips. Wake up in the morning, look for the good, you know, start seeing the good. And if there's nothing good, give Academy Awards for the nicest person, the cutest dog. Just start looking what is good and what's working. Number two, when something good happens, it's savor it for at least 20 seconds. You know, absorb that sunset. Someone says, gives you a compliment, take it in. And then three to one ratio. You're going to have negative thoughts. Okay. But don't let it, don't absorb it. Okay. You get the negative thought. Now counter it with three true but positive thoughts. And we'll start rewiring your brain for positivity. And I promise this works. I've been doing this for 35 years with my patients really makes a difference. So that's just some little tips on stress and happiness that will help your bones and, and just help your overall life as well. So before we end, I just want to show a little dance that we can all do that's really easy and really good for your bones. And if you go to tinyurl.com slash dancing on beach, because <laughs> I did it on the beach. You'll, I have a video on Vimeo that you can, um, you know, you can do, you can do it with it. But anyway, so everybody stands up. It just takes a minute. And all we're going to do, because people exercise and ideally you exercise, you know, at least, at least minimum, the research is twice a week for the strength training. And ideally, at least three times a week for the weight bearing. But this you can do all day because we're constantly getting forces on our bones. So number one, make sure you're in a good posture. Number two, it's going to be because stomping puts forces through your whole body, but gentle. We don't want to hurt ourselves. So we want a flat, relaxed foot. Don't hurt yourself. Again, this should be really gentle to not hurt. So when I learned this from Dr. Nan Lu, who's a doctor of Chinese medicine in New York City, and the National Osteoporosis Foundation, they were showing stomping as a great exercise, but this is even gentler and I think safer. So a gentle, relaxed foot, and we're just gonna, we're just like stomping real, in a good posture, real gentle. And then we can put our hands in this position and you stimulate meridians as well. So again, very easy, in good posture, it shouldn't hurt. And then if something's bothering you, you can just push it out, it feels so good. You know, if something's bothering you, just push it out. And you can just keep doing this whenever, super easy, you can put the music on, whatever you want. So just an easy thing that we can all do. And I tell people, this is one of the things I have people do throughout the day, because why not get good forces on your bones throughout the day? You feel that, you get that on your whole skeleton. Again, this shouldn't hurt, it should feel good. If that hurts, you don't do it. Oh, and I just wanted to mention that I have a program that talks about, it's called Happy Bones, Happy Life for anyone that wants to learn more. And, this program, as well as my happiness program, if you use the coupon code SUPPERS, I'm giving everybody a 50% reduction and you can just learn about it at happybonehappylife.com. And here are some additional resources. So my website, margiebissinger.com, I have a podcast where I've, I, I'm up to, I think 92 episodes, but I have them on exercise, all sorts of interesting things about bones. So lots of things. I also am a big, big, big believer in posture exercises and the same posture exercise. And so I created, I, I did this program, Two Weeks to Better Posture, where I have seven posture exercises and one Qigong exercise that's good for posture. And these are the same exercises that we do 
that I gave that the state does, I created for the state of New Jersey. So Project Healthy Bones and Move Today. And so if you want that, it's just a free, if you just go to happybones.happylife.com, I mean, slash gift. Or if you go to my website and you sign up for, you can sign up for it right there. And then there's Project Healthy Bones. It's a free program from the state of New Jersey that is amazing. It's so wonderful. It's been over 20 years and you can get involved with osteoporosis exercises. It's incredible. And so, and we have the, you know, we have the website here. It's the human services and, and a big, right now it's virtual, but they will have classes again. And you can also it's, look up the New Jersey Interagency Council on Osteoporosis. And we have some of these links for you on the handout as well. National Osteoporosis Foundation and American Bone Health. So these are just some other good resources. And Omar, do you wanna talk about the, can you pull up the um, the handout? Do you have the link for the handout? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, share my screen and show everything. But I just okay. want to time to thank everyone for joining us today, as well as the help of Marion Reinson and the Suppers Medical Advisory Board, as well as my research mentor, Dr. Mary Wagner, and my fellow classmates, Shandana Sagathi, Pooja Agrawal, Yushali, and Ethan Lim for all of their help. So I did just post um, a link for a survey. We would love to hear your feedback and any comments that you had about the presentation, any future presentations that you would like to hear. Um, and we also have a bone handout for you that I will post right now. And that just summarizes all the important things that we discussed today and has all the links of the additional resources um, to Margie's website, the Supper's website filled with their amazing recipes and for the additional organizations that we mentioned. So here's the thing, we have one life to live and we have these bones. Yes, they turn over, but we need to take care of them. So I think being part of suppers is unbelievable. You have such a head start by learning how to eat properly and learning all these amazing recipes. And I thank suppers because I just think this is the most incredible organization and I love your mission. And it's, it's besides improving your bones, it's improving every aspect of your health. So I think everyone is on the right track here. And I hope we provided some good information because we want to enjoy our life and we want and we can. There's no reason, no matter where you are right now, that you can't start doing things to improve your bones as well. And the silver lining is everything else gets better. So thank you so much. I thank Marta. It's been so I it's been so much fun working together. And thank you also sufferers for having us. And we're open to questions. Thank you.